All right. In theory, we're streaming. We're this live. always makes me a little nervous, but hello. Um, yeah, welcome. If you're joining us, we're going we're gonna to give everyone a few minutes to join, but welcome. This is the... All right. In theory, we're streaming. We're this live. Always, I forgot. I have to mute my other screen. Okay, done. So, uh, yeah, we are... We're streaming live our uh, midterm review. I'm here with Mr. Freeman. Hey. Hello. And we're going to be talking about units one and two. So uh, we're going to give everyone a few minutes to kind of trickle in and join and join the chat, say hello. Um, we're also going to be posting this video later uh, for anyone who can't make it. And I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint in just a few minutes. But um, first, I guess before we get started, uh, Mr. Freeman, you want to introduce yourself and kind of tell everyone who you are? Sure. Hello, I'm Ben Freeman from Freemanpedia.com. I'm a AP world history teacher in uh, Northern Virginia, as we call it, Loudoun County. Um, let's see, what else do you need to know? I I've been teaching AP world since 10-ish years, 12 years, something like that. I don't know, a long time. Nice. And uh, I'm an AP reader. Uh, I have a website. I just started a YouTube channel in September, and hopefully, oh, now we're sharing right. screen. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to help you guys review. Yeah, um, yeah. So Mr. Freeman and I have both been making some cool videos on YouTube, and I uh, guested on one of his talking about um, women's stuff, which I love to talk about. And so, yeah, I just figured that the two of us could get together. We can chat about units one and two. Uh, for those of you who are doing a midterm review, uh, we were just talking, not everyone is taking midterms maybe right now or at all because of the craziness. But if you are, we were going to just talk about some of our best ways to study and also some of the big developments from units one and two. The great thing about this too is that I'm going to save this live on my channel. And so then even when AP exams come around, you can come back and watch this and use it. So if you're watching right now, if you'll make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, so that you can see when I do other review stuff and also make sure you go over to Freemanpedia, the YouTube channel, and subscribe as well because we'll be doing a lot of stuff back and forth. So uh, welcome. I see as everyone's coming in. So I'm Emily Glankler I'm of Antisocial Studies. I also have obviously a YouTube channel. You're here. Hello. And I have a podcast that covers history. Um, and then a website that has a lot of review materials. So this is kind of what I'm showing y'all now. You can see I have a whole playlist here on my YouTube channel that's called AP World History for Students. And it walks you through, I do unit introductions and then I do deep dive videos into things I find interesting. So I did like a 10 minute video on the House of Wisdom or whatever. Um, on my website, antisocialstudies.org, you'll also see, um, I have a lot of like study materials where I have sample DBQs I've written. Um, study guides, that sort of thing. And then like Mr. Freeman was talking about, he also has a YouTube channel, Freemanpedia, where he does something called illustrative examples. And so really, but what'd you say? It kind of looks like me. Yeah. The, emo the emoji has more hair. It's, it's an old. It's an old <laughs> I think it's pretty good. I like it. Um, but yeah, do you want to tell us kind of what you've been doing with these illustrative example videos? So uh, as you all know, uh, your real teacher is named Steve Heimler and he has a ton of videos that he's been making for the past couple of years. So I didn't want to, obviously I couldn't duplicate that. So you get enough uh, bald bearded Southerners telling you history things in front of books. So, so I decided uh, um, to do like specific topics like Ms. Blankler was just saying, uh, thing, what I try to do, because I obviously run this website, but my uh, channel, Illustrative Examples, or Illustrative Examples, I think I'm saying it wrong, but I've started saying Illustrative. So I say Illustrative too. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So then we're right, because there's two of us and we agree. So uh, so I decided to, there's a thing in the CED, the course exam description, which is what they give us. And they say, hey, teach this stuff. And that's all they say. And uh, that's all we, they say nothing on the exam will be outside of that. So if you go from that, uh, then you can't go wrong. But they'll say, um, they'll say, um, I don't know, women's rights or something. Like teach them about <laughs> women's rights. And but then there's like three illustrative examples. So we pulled the Declaration of Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen, which is probably units ahead of where you are now. It is well ahead of where I am. But uh, you can. But like what I did was I went online and went on YouTube. And was like, is there anything on here? Like if 
you were trying to search it or find things. Like, is there anything on YouTube to like help you? And if there's not, I was like, boom, all right, I'm going to take that one. I'm going to use it, whether it's chompa rice or flouts or uh, Ottoman tax farming. Like a lot of this, I'm not an expert on stuff, right? So I had to find this stuff too. So I was like, well, there's nothing for kids. So then there should be something for you guys. So uh, there better be. So instead of doing like an overall, like 1.1 is this, 2.1 is that? Uh, I just pick one of the illustrative examples and kind of run with it. And so- That's awesome. That was the point. Yeah. And really, we were just talking about before we started, really, like, you can have the trifecta of, like, you have Heimler for your just, like, bread and butter. What's 1.1? What's 1.2? We all love Heimler. And then you can come to me and Mr. Freeman for your, I don't know, for a little bit more of your complexity, right? Like, if you want, like, Heimler might mention the House of Wisdom really briefly, and then you can come over and watch my video. Or he might mention Ottoman tax farming, which sounds really boring and is a lot more interesting than it sounds. And you can go check that out on Freemanpedia. So, um, again, between all of us, hopefully we are giving you a lot of great stuff for reviewing. Um, and Freemanpedia is what it sounds like. It is like Wikipedia, but specifically for AP World. You can go and like find whatever you need and we'll be showing y'all some examples. So with that, uh, let me see. I I'm curious, like Mr. Freeman, what do you tell your students in terms of like, what are the best ways to start studying? Because if students are sitting there and they're like, oh gosh, I have a midterm coming up. It might be over multiple units. This might be the biggest test they've studied for so far. What are your tips? Uh, the first tip on any test is, is to, I don't know if it's the first tip. The first thing that came to my mind just now is you should think about what you're freaking out about right now. And on the next unit, make sure you don't land back at the same point again. Like make your, oh, I didn't do this, or I didn't study that, or I didn't take notes on this, or oh, I just winged that. Uh, and then that test time anxiety you have, that's a result of like the units or unit you've been doing. So you need to take that as kind of a, a teachable moment for yourself as like, okay, like, so right now, if you guys have an exam, I don't know if you guys are doing, uh, we're not doing a midterm this year, but if you're doing a midterm coming up, uh, then you need to start, or you, hopefully if you've had other tests this year, you need to start thinking back as of right where you are right now and be like, oh crap, I need to make sure on my final exam or who cares about your final exam on the AP exam, that's what matters, uh, that you're not in that same point. So you need to fill in the gaps that you have. And uh, it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird thing for, uh, I don't know, I teach sophomores. I think most people teach sophomores. Yeah. Uh, there was a poll online the other day and it, was, it seemed like way more sophomores than anything else. Uh, but you, this is a moment where you are, you're like officially not in middle school anymore. Like you, you're, it's middle school is be way behind you and college is quick, quickly approaching. So you need to start developing skills as to how you can study, how you take notes, how you remember, how you, whatever. And you need to, and luckily you're in an AP class now, <laughs> luckily, congratulations, you're in an AP class. And so you're in, it's college level, but it's close to college. It's similar to college level stuff. So this is the kind of stuff that I had to figure out my freshman year of college with no parents around, no support, um, barely an internet in 1998, right? It was <laughs> dial up. So there wasn't like stuff. So now you have all the stuff and you need to have it at your disposal. And so besides like checking yourself right now so that you don't do this again, uh, organization is key. You need to have everything where you can find it. And don't start at the beginning of your notes and just be like, okay, 1.1, like read through. Don't study stuff, you know, find the weird stuff, find the difficult stuff and start with that and then work your way out from that. So I first tip is get your stuff and get it in. If, if well, you probably don't have book bags anymore. I don't know <laughs> you do. Uh, my stuff would always be at the bottom. Like I just got an organizer the other day with a calendar on it to keep, I'm 40, to keep me in line. So uh, it's a process, but being organized and knowing where things are and kind of scheduling out your studying. Like if you're here now, that's probably a good sign because units one and two are, if you're doing a midterm for the first four units, there's no better way to study than, or to remember things than to go back to them. And so the more times you go back, that's like how memory works. So if you're doing yeah. this now, you're a step ahead, look around, I can't say, my computer is stupid. I'm running through my county computer. So the YouTube live things blocked or whatever. So for the 85,000 people that are here right now, for every person that's not in your class, that's for, for every person not in your, wait, for all the people in your class who aren't here, you're learning more than them because you're, you're going back and revisit, even if it's just like, oh, House of Wisdom, oh yeah, I remember that. Someone else hasn't heard that word since September. So you are now ahead of them. So congratulations. You're now smarter than everyone in your class. And Yay. you need to tell them that I told them. 
<laughs> that's where I would start. Get organized. Get your stuff in line. Know know your strengths and weaknesses, and start studying. Yeah, I think that's a really good. I think it's really good advice too to like make sure that you know what your midterm or whatever the test is going to look like, and then think back to the previous tests you've taken, and you might find that like okay, if maybe it was a mix of different things, and I've always done really well on the multiple choice, but then I've struggled on short answer questions, and so then you know what you maybe need to focus some of your time on. The other thing I tell my students is I say start with like a blank piece of paper or a blank, blank Google Doc and say, okay, what are all the things I remember from 1200 to 1450? And just give yourself 10 minutes to just brainstorm everything you can remember. Because if you remember it still, then great, you don't need to study it again. I find that students will spend time studying every single point, even though some of it's stuff they already know. And so taking stock of what you already know is really important as well. Um, a few other things I always talk to students about is like you you want to start broad and work your way down to the details. What I always notice students do is they immediately start making flashcards or start making a quizlet and like memorizing individual facts. And that's making it a lot harder on yourself because then you have a lot of individual things you need to remember. But if you start with the big broad developments and then work your way down and say, oh, these five terms all show this big development that I understand, in your brain it simplifies things. There's brain science behind it, but I'm not a scientist. I just know that it is a thing. <laughs> and so I, that's what I do. So there are a few ways you can get that big picture. You can have, uh, Mr. Freeman was talking about the CED, which is called the course exam and description. Um, and you just Google that and you have the, you'll find the PDF from the college board. But I've also made a simplified version that's on my website. And so I've made a simplified version that just kind of shows you this is what the college board is saying you should be able to do. And so if you're like, I don't know what the big developments in China were. Go look here and they will literally tell you. They will have sentences that say things like the Song Dynasty utilized traditional methods of Confucianism and an imperial bureaucracy run by the scholar gentry. Great. That's the big development. That's what you should know. And then you might want to dive deeper to make sure like, do I know what traditional methods of Confucianism are? Do I know what the scholar gentry is and how they worked in the bureaucracy? And if so, check that off your list and move on. So start with the big ideas and then work your way down to really specific facts. Some other resources for this are on uh, Freemanpedia. So like if you're more of a visual learner, you'll see that like, for example, you make these amazing maps, which is like what I dream of doing and don't have the tech savvy to do. Right. So do you want to walk us through kind of what some of these are and how you might use them? If I told you how how like low tech I make these maps, it's li it's literally a word document and I put a map on it and I draw on it. like with, oh well, with like a mouse. And then I like fill it in with colors and it's really not as, as difficult as it seems. But what I try to do for every single every single unit, which is weird here, the time grid is a little weird here because that's from an old the old way we used to do the class. But the, the map here, I try to do a map for every unit. So that's unit one, Global Tapestry. Anything the College Board says that is uh, that is mappable, like it's something that you could visually see on a map, I put it on the map. And so that stuff is all there. And so I do that, a big one for every unit, and then for every subunit, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, is that as far as it goes? So whatever, how far it goes, there's a, there's, where it's possible, there's a, a map that covers everything in that section. So you can visually see. So uh, like what Ms. Glengler was saying as well, like you can, like if you take that big picture idea and you just put a map down for each thing, and okay, well, what's going on over here? Where do I need here? That could, I tried to do that for you. So you have that. And that's not just oh, 1.1, 1 .1, 1.2, that's 7.3, that's 8 point, stuff we never even taught because of pandemic. So I've spent all summer like do like continually going on and filling those out. So for every subsection, I have a, a whole page for it, 1.1, 1.1, 1 1 whatever. And so there's terms to know, there's maps, there's people to know. I also came up with the what I think is a definitive list of all of the people you should know in AP World History. Now, some of them are maybe a little too specific, but I think they're either, they're, the college board either says, hey, Ibn Batuta, know this guy right now. Or it's someone tangentially like connected that you should know. Like they don't say Isaac Newton, but you should know. It's actually, I don't think he's in there because there's no scientific revolution. Bad example. But uh, <laughs> so there's a list of all the people to know and that's broken into each subsection too. So if you're on and you want to go on and um, see that and, and click on that. And then I, I, I'm extra as 
children say. So I did. I also have like five pieces of art to know for each 1.1.2. I have uh, five uh, documents to know. Now that's probably getting way too in depth, but if you scroll through, I mean, those images are like, oh, the Great Wall for China. Yeah, I should probably know that, like stuff like that. So those maps I think can be, be very helpful. The overall unit maps can get kind of busy because it's six subunits on there. But if you go into the subsections themselves, uh, you can actually go and see a much, like you'll see just, uh, what is that? 1.1, uh, oh, East Asia, just East Asia. So there's Chopper Rice on there. There's um, Marco Polo comes walking in. You can see yeah. the show in Japan. Like the stuff visually, like like Ms. Klingo said, if you're a visual learner, that's a good spot to like, oh, okay, this, this, this. Oh, what is that? I've never heard that word before. Maybe you should hear that word, right? So yeah. that's, a, that's another way to do it. And I think too, like using these as a checklist as well. So you can use the CED, that's way more in depth, but you could also go and pull up these maps and pull up these time grids and that sort of thing. And like you were saying, just look at them and go like, okay, all right, Mamluks, I remember Mamluks. Okay, Berbers, I remember those. But then maybe you see something and you're like, Seljuks, I don't remember that at all. And that just tells you, okay, now I'm gonna go into something more in depth. I'm gonna go back into my notes. I'm gonna go into my textbook, whatever, and look up that specific thing. So I think the thing about studying is that you wanna start broad and kind of take stock of what do you already know pretty well, right? You're not going to know everything, but what do you already know pretty well? And you can use these to kind of gauge that. And then when you go into the more in-depth kind of overwhelming resources, that's either your textbook or that's a, a more in-depth video or whatever, you're doing it strategically on the things you like, you need a little bit more information on. I know I have students that'll be like, I reread my whole book. And I'm like, why would you ever do that? That sounds awful. So instead take stock. So you can pull up these maps and just do it as a checklist. Okay. I kind of remember this stuff. I feel good about that. Here's a civilization that I'm like, I don't remember anything. And then you know what you need to go focus on. And so these are a lot of different strategies, but I think the biggest takeaway is that the way these exams are built and assuming your teacher is making a midterm that's based kind of on the AP exam, you don't need to memorize every single fact from history, right? You don't, that's actually not the strategic way to prepare for these tests. These tests are way more thematic and they're way more focused on like, what are the broad developments that are happening? And then what are illustrative examples that prove that, right? And so I'm seeing like a question in the chat about flashcards, which like, if ever a girl loved flashcards, it was this one and like color coded flashcards. Oh my gosh. Um, and I think flashcards are great, but they should be the last thing you do, right? So you should really have down what, what I sort of explain, and this is where I'm going to get real nerdy for a second. I'm sorry, Mr. Free. You're about to like, you're about to see some real nerdness and it's going to be great. The ancient Romans had a memory technique where they described the brain as a house with many rooms. And they basically said the Romans could remember like a three hour speech and they would walk home from the Senate and like recite it word for word. And what they said was you just have to create a space in your brain where that information belongs and it's easier to remember. And so what you should do is you should start really big picture, just the time periods, right? Units one and two, 1200 to 1450. Keep all the information underneath that umbrella. So if you're gonna make a Quizlet or make flashcards, have one that's just for this time period and then make a separate one for the next time period. And then you wanna go underneath that to, to bigger developments. Okay, what's generally happening, which is what we're about to do for y'all for 1200 to 1450, and work your way down to where the last thing you have is the flashcard or the Quizlet. And so let's say maybe you have all of them organized and you say, okay, these are all the terms that relate to Chinese government. And these are all the terms that relate to the Abbasid government, whatever keep them in that organizational system. The thing that drives me crazy is when I see people that have these beautifully organized flashcards and the day before the test, they do a like shuffle them all up, see if I really know it. And it's like, no, you just undid all this organization you'd made for your own brain. Yeah. So whatever that works, some people are visual. So having that information on a map like Mr. Freeman has made is a great way to do that. Some people are a little bit more verbal and want to do flashcards and kind of talk it out. Whatever it is, just make some sort of organizational structure. So you're not just memorizing a bunch of words, if that makes sense. And if, if you're a visual, let me out nerd you here. <laughs> you just, I'll just raise the bar. If you, uh, if in that same idea of like keeping everything in structure, if you think of, and wait, 
wait till you're 17 or accompanied by an adult. But if you've ever seen at least the intro to Game of Thrones each week, how it goes from through the map and it's playing in that music and it's like, oh, well, this house does this and it's whatever gears or whatever is going on. And then as soon as the intro is over, you turn it off because you're not 17 or accompanied by an adult. But that intro, think of like each map as that, like, can you zoom in and kind of go through with that music or whatever playing and like, okay, what's going on here? What's that story? Like, what's the, like, you should be able to look at unit one and unit one anyway. I don't know if you, you okay, warning, unit one and two are the worst units. They suck. They're oh. big, they're vague, they're broad. They were literally thrown together over the summer two, two years ago now because people complained about the organization. So once you get to unit three, if you get to unit three, you're like, oh, this is much, this is much more clear as to or unit four. This is much, so, it is. It's because they spent years working on that and they spent months working on this. But so it's harder to get unit one. It's like, oh, well, here's what happened in unit one because it's like all over and it's like a bunch of different stuff. So thematically that, but you should have the story of unit one where you can be like, oh, they're doing that over there and that over there and that over there and that over there and that over there. And then that's fine. And then I'm just going to said, if you can, the more you can zoom in, the better, but the test isn't going to ask you Ibn Battuta's birthday. It's going to ask you, did, you know, was, tr was global traveling, something about that. And if you're like, oh, that sounds like that Ibn Battuta guy. Yeah. Like, then you know it, you just know a specific version of it. So the, the broader you can do it, the more of those rooms in your head, which is also brain science. Like that's how all the genius people memorize like decks of cards when they're stacking them in like memorization contest if you do that in your head that's another way to do it again now is the time to try and fail and if you bomb a test then the, you fix it on the next one so that when you get to college you're like boom oh this is how i work because it's your brain's different than my brain's different than miss glankler's brain so yeah awesome so with that let's just start talking about units one and two right so we're talking about 1200 to 1450 like mr freeman said we unit one and two are so weird and the reason is because unit one is like i call it the roll call unit it's just like roll call who's here in 1200 and we just hop around the world and there's not really a narrative and i want a narrative so i've made one for y'all because that's what I do in my free time. Here is my narrative <laughs> for 1200 to 1450. In one sentence, you can summarize it as trade routes connected civilizations more than ever before. That's my thesis statement about 1200 to 1450. That's my big umbrella of like, and in AP language, they call it networks of exchange, but they mean trade routes, right? And so that's our big umbrella. And then we can really talk about almost everything that's going on in units one and two within the context of that statement, whether it supports that statement or, oh, this is a weird exception or something else that was going on. And so I think we'll kind of, we're going to stay on this slide for a while and we're going to um, kind of talk through some of these statements and talk about what are some specific examples. And we're also hopefully going to answer questions that y'all have. So some of you are asking, are you gonna be able to pull this up? Um, I'm gonna post this on my website right when this is over, this PowerPoint. I'll be honest, this is the last slide. This is it, it's mostly gonna be us talking. But I'm gonna post this on my website, antisocialstudies.org, um, as soon as we're done. So I think that the first context is like by 1200, trade routes are like raging, right? Trade routes have grown and expanded, right? We had the collapse after the end of the classical era, which we apparently don't need to worry about now, but they've risen again from the ashes and trade routes like the Silk Road, the Saharan Desert, the Indian Ocean are just like booming. And so the first is we want some context on like, how did that happen? So what's what what? how do you kind of explain where these all came from? Where the trade routes came from? Yeah, like what's going on? Why, why are there so many, like there's new innovations, there's new states, but like why now? Why in the 1200s and 1300s are they so powerful? Well, you do have to kind of look at that global fall, eh, global, but you know, the big classical stuff is gone now. And so you start to have these new empires kind of coalesce and emerge and they, you know, it's, it's, you hate to think of it as like you're playing civilization or like age of empires or something, but like people next door have something you need, you have something they need. Sometimes it's that simple. And the further you can go, the more money you can make. And so these networks uh, grow and that, that intro sentence is perfect. Like trade routes connected more that's literally everything in unit one and unit two is something about a trade route whether it's the people and where they go so uh i mean it's just as simple as the empire next to you or uh oh well you're this religion oh well where are you from so let's go pilgrim do a pilgrimage to your and then you start having connections and so the 
the notion trade starts to get dominated by uh, maybe at first Buddhism and Islam comes on full scale and starts taking over large areas. Islam, the religion's not taking over large areas, but you know, the belief system does. And then, oh, well, assalamu alaikum. Oh, you, where do you trade? Where are you from? Let's go trade back and forth. And so people are going to start making money wealth. I mean, it's the same reason, you, you know, your parents are on the stock market and like trading stuff. It's the same reason you're trying to click a PS5. Uh, you have some, people have stuff you want, you, so do they. And now people are strong enough and powerful enough to be able to send people over either a, a long way or they have embassies where they need allies or they have enemies and so people join together so there's a million reasons that they come together but these when you're looking at these trade routes you think of them as sorry i have my unit two map i'm so visual i have to use my own maps i have my units to map up the networks of exchange one but like when you look at any of these it's it's literally like i don't know you look at where things originate and then people will go to that to get it i mean it, mm -hmm. I hate this unit. It's so broad and vague. I'm such a specific like this guy met this guy and then killed that guy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and you go where you can, you know, uh, flat land, you can travel right across. If you go south, you run into the Himalayas or, oh, well, these trade winds push you into India, but only at certain times a year. So you're only going to trade your end. So, uh, yeah. well, you know, is it worth crossing the desert? If you like gold and salt, it is. And everyone does. So that's going to be a very high uh, resource. And then with that stuff, uh, different things like fruits and vegetables and bananas and stuff goes with it and, and religion. And so that's really all, everything else fits into that. Everything else yeah. is, is it, this, it's a, it's a, it's a unit of highways. And if and it's every, everything that along, everything that is along the highway matters. And if you look at any map of any of this stuff, like everything else doesn't for this course, people are important and relationships. Yeah, trade. but for AP World History, it's not like it's they are really heavy on the trade routes, especially in this first era. It's like there are, there are so few specific people you need to know, and the people you do need to know notice are the ones who traveled across trade routes. <laughs> so it's like Mansa Musa went on his Hajj, or Marco Polo went to China. Or like, so the only individual people you really need to know are those that traveled these routes. And so I think- uh, it, Went along the Indian Ocean trade, you know. And so exactly, like yeah. And so I think that when we think about these trade routes expanding, it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing, right? And I said this in my two statements below, I say, powerful states controlled trade routes and then trade routes create more powerful states. And it becomes this snowball effect. So like, for a little bit of context, right, the classical civilizations in the era of like Rome and Han China is done by around the 500s, right? It, those have collapsed some earlier than that. And so it takes some time for those to rebuild. But by the time we get to around 1200, they have rebuilt and you have a powerful state in China. You have powerful states in the Middle East. You have a powerful still Byzantine empire that controls part of the Mediterranean, powerful states in Africa and India. And so they are able to trade. And the other thing is that those powerful states recognize how beneficial trade is that they innovate. And so one of the big themes of this unit is states sponsoring innovation. You see states like the Abbasid Caliphate building the House of Wisdom. It wasn't a real building, who knows, but creating it and inviting scholars to come from all over the world because they're like, I think science is going to be helpful to me. I'm not sure why, but I think it might help me get further or travel other places. And so they want to translate texts from Aristotle. They want to be able to read the skies um, because all of it's going to be important for trade and for power, right? Or same thing like in, so in the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty in Hangzhou creates this cosmopolitan city where they like eliminate curfews and they want people from all over. You have Jewish merchants living in there. You have Arab traders living in there, and they're encouraging people to share and spread ideas. Marco and so Polo. Marco Polo comes and visits when Kublai Khan is governing. And so the idea is most of these states recognize that trade is the way to gain power. And so once they recognize that, it's a snowball effect. So they encourage innovation that makes trade and travel easier. So one of the other things that happens, for example, like we don't think about stuff like this, but the first camel makes it to Africa in like the 400s or 500s. Before then, how did you cross the Sahara Desert? You did it, right? And so there are actual real reasons why now some of these trade routes have time to grow. Islam starts expanding in the 600s. And Islam is a really unique religion because it actively encourages trade, which is not something a lot of other states really did. A lot of states thought, 
well, trade is important, but like farming is the most important thing. But Muhammad was a trader. He worked on a caravan and he said, like, seek knowledge unto China, go out and kind of spread the word, but also learn about the world. And so when you have the rise of a powerful Islamic state, which you do after the 600s, and you definitely do with the Ab Abbasid Caliphate, well, now you have a huge state promoting people traveling and trading around the world and other states kind of go, oh, shoot, we should get in on that, too. Right. And and if you go back to the old again, going back to Rome, the old uh, all roads lead to Rome. Right. Whenever they would go conquer somewhere, they would build a road that went to Rome so that that trade would pick up. Well, Islam has a built in and everyone needs to come back at a certain point in the year. Uh, on the Hajj. And so the more people go out, it's just, it, it connects people more. It keeps the religion from fragmenting too much, although obviously it will. Uh, so yeah, the, these trade routes, God, this map is busy. Sorry, the one I made is really busy. But but if you just, if you just know, they're all just different trade routes and they're all, and plus, you know, you go far enough and you're powerful enough, people will pay you tribute. So that's another way that you can make money. Yeah. And you know, that's how Chompa rice is going to be spreading. That's how a lot of that stuff moves around. So it's really, a map of highways and the people and reasons why they're there. And then that's, if you're, if you're doing that, the big story picture, that's really all this is. Yeah. I mean, there's some specific innovations too that come around or before this time period that are really important. If you're talking about basically, essentially, if you're thinking about land-based trade routes, like the Sahara Desert or the Silk Road, it's how do you get places faster and without having to carry as much stuff? Those are the innovations for land-based trade. So like, I'm gonna type this on here, but so for land-based trade, you have things like the camel saddle, where you can now ride a camel, uh, caravans, you can travel in groups and not be robbed as easily, right? You have safe places to stay along the way, which are like caravan sarai, they're like the Motel 6. Motel 6? Motel 8. Motels of the Silk It's funny that I do the same thing. I'm like, yeah, it's like a hotel where we could stop, but it literally means like caravan palace. But we're like, yeah, it's like a hotel, six. motel six. We'll keep the light on for you or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There it's a really, place. A lot of them are really nice, though. They're like, yeah. Oh, they like entire cities, right? Rise up because like Kashgar just is an oasis city that has these amazing caravans around that people are like, cool, I'll hang out here for a while and know that I won't get robbed and my camel can drink water, right? It's a big deal. Um, so you're not going to randomly walk into the woods with nothing, but if you know you're going to be safe where you're going, that's way you can take money and wealth with you and bring stuff back and feel safe. And so it's it's little things like that that you think of like. Oh, that's always been around. No, it hasn't. It happened in 1200 to 1450. Yeah. And, oh, and flying cash. Like, oh. like imagine like you, you farm for like a year, spend all that. And then someone hands you some like stuff. They're like, oh, that's what it's worth. I'm like, no, it's not. Give me gold or silver. I know what that's worth. Not a little piece of paper. If you can like accept that and you have an economy that can support that, that's like next level. That's beyond like, I'll give you three goats for four chickens or whatever. That's like way closer to what we have now than what was there a thousand years before. Yeah, that's one of these innovations that's really important to think about. The Song Dynasty essentially create, now paper money, essentially. And they create this idea of flying cash where you you basically like will be in one trading city and you will say, okay, I'm turning in all my stuff that I've been making trading or whatever, and I'm gonna get this sort of, it's also sometimes called a bill of exchange so that I just have to carry this. Before then you would be carrying literal like metal currency. And there are people, pictures of people in China that still do this, but they have like necklaces of like dozens of pounds of coins just around their neck, right? Like a, coin, a coin would have like a hole in the middle and you would yeah. like put it on a string and like carry it like that. What are we doing? Like how long and would that be? I mean, that the worst ATM, like that's terrible, but like, you know, that's how it would work. And imagine you can't even trade that much if you can, if you're just carrying all, all these chain ropes with like, it's, it's a much better form uh, of exchange, I guess. And the other thing to think about too, is that like something like paper money can't come about until you have a strong and stable government. Like think about there's almost nothing that's more emblematic of trusting your government than paper money, right? Because we like in the United States, we all agree a dollar is a dollar. And what is a dollar? I don't know. It's worth a dollar. It's 60 cents, a hundred cents, a hundred cents, 60 seconds. Oh my God. 60 cents? You're on the Sumerian dollar, apparently. Oh my gosh, I'm on the Sumerian dollar. Okay, this is what this is what quarantine has done to my brain. Um, and so, like, you have something like China. Once you have a super stable Chinese bureaucracy, and you and China controls a lot of land to where you know, as a merchant, I can leave Kaifeng or I can leave Hangzhou and make it to Kashgar, and someone there will recognize this piece of paper money from China as valid. 
that's what you need. And this is one of those reasons why when the Mongols conquer so much land, they reinvigorate trade even more because now it's all under the control of one kind of overarching system. And so you can travel way further and like your paper money is valid or whatever for a much longer way. And the people protecting you are the blanking Mongols. So they respect trade more than anyone. So if anyone's going to do anything to you, not when the Mongols are in town, especially if you didn't have the pass, right? And so when these trade routes open, kind of the worst case scenario would be, wow, we're all so connected now and like all oh, wealth is easy to flow back and forth. And, you know, you can just go town to caravan safari care and you can just kind of follow it all the way to the next group. And it's so easy to get around. The worst case scenario would be if there's a big scary group of people on horses that were killing everyone. Or if there was a disease that came through and got everyone and those things kind of happened at the same time so yeah. you got again play that's a story of trade routes mongols that's a story of trade routes it's all trade routes yeah and then when you think about sea-based innovations it's all like knowing where you are in the world right so this is another example of how you can simplify things a lot of students will make flashcards for like the compass latin sales flying cash, caravans. And it's like, no, 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 start with the big idea. This is something we're modeling for you, right? We start with innovations help trade routes expand. Then underneath that, we're like, well, what innovations were helpful for land-based trade? What innovations were helpful for sea-based trade? Then we get to the specific terms because now they're in their proper context because you don't actually need to know how a compass works. I don't know how a compass works. I famously don't know how an astrolabe works. I've talked about it so many times in my class. You hold it up. It's... And- you, you aim it at the North Star. Sure. Where that, if that's hanging right, it tells you a number. And then the distance from that to the perihelion. And then you know where you are. Yeah, I yeah. Know. I just sing I the know. song. I just sing the song from Moana that's like, we read by the wind and the sky. That's what I do in class to explain this stuff. I'm like, I don't know, but they do it. The point is, like, you don't actually need to know, like, the history of the astrolabe or the history of the compass necessarily. You need to know why it matters to us. And why it matters to us is that it was an innovation that helped expand sea-based or maritime trade, right? And keep in mind, if you're in the desert, it's the same as if you're in the ocean. Yeah. Like, just because you're, whatever's underneath you doesn't matter. You still have the same, you still have to go by the stars. So it shouldn't be a surprise to you that uh, Islam being in that area crossing deserts and, and they are coming up with the astrolabe or perfecting it. Don't get me into the... Greeks versus Arab <laughs> argument is to start, but whatever, they're using it to get around and they have perfected whatever that math thing is that makes you go that way. Well, it's probably algebra, which they also invented. So uh, keep that in mind that crossing the desert, it's the same as if you're sitting in a boat, like, where are you? There's no land masses, there's nothing to help you out. You know, so that's going to tell you where you are and how far you have to get to where you need to be. So yeah, if you can, and, and for most things, you only need like one or two things in your head about it. So if you're like, okay, uh, compass and astrolabe, boom, that's how they get around. Uh, Dow ships and Latin sails, boom, that's in the water. You know, if you're just doing, you don't need to know 50, like for some of these things in my stupid channel, there's all these illustrative examples. You only need like one, you only need one to, to do. So don't feel like you have to know everything about everything. If you just know one or two things about like, oh, trade got easier, uh, camels, caravans, all right, cool, moving on. Like, that's all you need. You don't have to give 50 examples for anything ever. Yeah. And there's a really good question in the chat that's like, what would be potential SAQ questions for a final? And what's really great is if you go back and look at that CED that I I have a simplified version on my website, you can also just Google AP World History CED and it'll come up. I mean, those are SAQ props. It's just change it to like identify and explain one way that blah, blah, blah. But as an example, like what you might see on an SAQ on a test for what we just talked about is you might be like, you might see identify and explain one innovation that advanced maritime trade. And then like to Mr. Freeman's point, you would say one innovation was Latin sails. These sails helped harness the monsoon winds and allowed sailors to go further across the Indian Ocean. They're not going to ask you or they shouldn't ask you um, if it's your teacher making the final, they shouldn't ask you like explain the Latin sail. Right. They should ask you about a broader development and then you come up with the example. Now, the other way that something like Latin sales might show up on a test is in a multiple choice question. But again, there's not going to be a question that's going to be like, which of the following is the name for the sale that blah, 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 Latin, Lantern, Latern, like that's those are not AP questions. What you might see is you might see a document describing Latin sales. And then it would be like, the innovation discussed above was most helpful for, and then you pick the thing that's like maritime travel and trade or whatever. So even if it pops up in a multiple choice question, 
it shouldn't be, at least on the AP exam, it's not going to be something that's just rote memorization. It's still going to be in relation to whatever development we're talking about. So, yeah, because this is a history class, but the tests are college board things. So we make tests in the same style as that. So you need to think like they do. And after you've had a couple under your belt, you should probably know there's not going to be a question that says, like Ms. Glenko was saying, like it's going to be like a stimuli of some kind. And if you know in your head, Latin sail helps, uh, you know, it can sail into the wind and stuff, Indian Ocean trade. And there's a question about that should guide you to the right answer. So even if it's not even about a Latin sail, something along or a compass, like something, if you know even just little specifics like that, hopefully, and I know your tests are timed and it's one a minute and all that, but you sh it should be there in your brain. You should be able to go to that room in your head and uh, like connect it to that and then boom, move on. So, yeah. so you don't expect, and that's the problem with flashcards. Flashcards like, or Quizlet can make you think like, oh, this is this and this is this, but they're gonna ask you like this big trend. And maybe if you know about camel saddles, that'll help you. The only reason knowing camel saddles specifically would help you is in that SAQ. Can you identify and explain? Then if yeah. you can do that, then uh, that's why you would need camel caravan Sarai maybe because I mean, if they said identify one, then identify another, that would be mean. But if they did, uh, you would have two there or you, maybe you can explain one more than the other. So, so yeah, yeah. Do, think, do think in college board testing because if you're in AP world, you might be taking AP US and you might be taking AP Gov and it's the same evil company that's gonna come get you each time. So think the way <laughs> they're gonna ask you. And honestly, I, I like, I think that this way of testing is more useful, right? But it's just not the thing that we're used to. We're used to a history test being like, I got to memorize 1492 is Columbus and whatever. And that's not, we got to reverse our thinking and start broad and work your way down. Um, and that way, right? Because if you, if you understand the broad developments, you can infer in a lot of different multiple choice questions. If like you're saying, Mr. Freeman, if you just memorize what a camel saddle is, well, you're gonna ace any questions about a camel saddle, but otherwise you haven't helped yourself out. And so the the other thing that, that is important for us to think about is states, because unit one is really all about the different states that exist. And it's kind of similar to what we were just talking about. I would argue that the best way to prepare for a test, especially the AP test, is think about geographically each region and make sure that you know a decent amount about one major state in each of those regions at first. And so to me, the different regions are like, you have the Americas, you have Europe, you have Africa, the Middle East, and then East Asia, South Asia, South Southeast Asia. And so it's sort of like, okay, if you feel like you can at least identify and talk in some detail about a few of those, like one state for each region, you're probably okay. Obviously, you want to know what the other states are so that if you see it in a multiple choice prompt and you see the Srivijaya, you're like, you know, that's Southeast Asia, but you don't have to know everything about each state. And so for me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, Mr. Freeman, but like for me, I feel like if we're talking about powerful states that really helped control trade routes and helped grow them. Are we ranking? Um, I like ranking. What'd you say? Are we ranking? Because I like ranking things. Oh, we can rank. But like to me, the two, it's sort of the two polar ends are like the Abbasid Caliphate and the Song Dynasty, right? Yeah. I, well, it, again, these stupid years, it depends on the year, but yes. Like, and also because those are two that they specifically say in the CED. Mm -hmm. So that helps. But yeah, I would say uh, maybe, maybe Delhi, Delhi Sultanate. Mm, I don't know. There's too many factors in India, but you're right. It's, the song is easily one. Like, yes. absolutely know that. Um, because they come up over and over, and of course they get conquered, but still, they're a big deal. Ooh, yeah. Or I think was, you, could, you could say Molly's big deal for being the only place on the other side of the. Yeah. The, the, I think to me, though, all of those become sort of satellites of Dar al Islam. And so if you really think about it, the first two topics that the, of the whole AP World History class is 1.1 developments in East Asia, and it's the Song Dynasty. And number two is developments in Dar al-Islam or like the Islamic world. And so if you only have space in your brain for two civilizations in this time period, those are the two you have to know. Because those are the two that are really, they're kind of the regional superpowers, right? The Song Dynasty is like the superpower of kind of East Asia. And Dar al-Islam, which at its height is immediately the Abbasid Caliphate, is like the regional superpower of what we think of now as the cultural Middle East, which is going to include Mali, right? Like Mali becomes kind of part of that orbit a little bit because their leaders convert to Islam. They're their own separate states. 
But so that's the other thing too, is like being strategic. It's going to be way more worth your time to learn some detail about the Song Dynasty than it is to learn some detail about the Majapahit, right? And like no shade to the Majapahit. I think they're badass and awesome. But it's just like the Song Dynasty lasts a lot longer and also influences a lot more places. And so really, if you think about it that way, those are like the two main states that are dominant they control a lot of territory, they control a lot of the trade routes, then obviously both of them get conquered by the Mongols who just usurp them and become the one state. And then really the other development that's happening on the other end of it, the way I think of it, is that also these trade routes are creating new powerful states. And a lot of those are gonna be new smaller like city states that come about just to capitalize on trade. So the example I used in my class earlier is if you're looking at someplace like Malacca, the little city state sultanate of Malacca, they're almost like those fish that like swim and attach themselves to a shark. And the kids reminded me what that was called, but like the shark is the Song Dynasty and Malacca is the little fish. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? There's a name for it. There is a name. There's an Octonauts really? episode about it, I'm sure. but. So the idea is like you have these big guys, right? The huge traditional land-based empires that are dominating. But then you also have these smaller city-states that are rising up and that are becoming powerful really only because they control an important like trade route or strait or port city or whatever, right? And so to me, that's really centered on the Indian Ocean, right? So to me, it's like the Swahili city-states on the East Coast. It's... Um, it's going to be like, you know, Gujarat, uh, the places of South India, Vijayanagara, so many A's. Um, and then it's going to be the Southeast Asian kingdoms, right? They, they kind of like, they produce their own things. They do other things. But a lot of them, like, really all their power comes because geographically they control a, an important part of the trade route, right? That's, yeah, that's another thing to, to like, okay, so we just named the two two big spots. So Darul Islam and and East and Song China, East Asia are one A and one B, like most important thing. Well, they're trading with each other, even if it's distantly. So how do you get there? Oh, well, look, you kind of have to wedge your way in between this one tiny little spot in Southeast Asia, like right where this town Malacca. Oh, well, that's an important town because you have to go by it. No matter, do you want to cross the Himalayas? Do you want to just wander out into the middle of nowhere? Or do you want to go through a sea route? You know, well, if you're using a sea route, you're using, you can trade a lot more stuff in a boat, right? So if you you have to go through there, so that, that's why Srivijaya, which is like a what? Never heard of that place. That's why that's that important because every other place you have heard of knows them because they all have the highway goes through there. It's the biggest pit stop in the world, right? That's the spot you have to go. So little Srivijayas and and um, you know you're like oh Swahili coast, what is, like the little uh, Mombasa and little places like that. Yeah, that's the trade. You want to get into Africa? That's where you trade right there. So all those little spots where there isn't a big state like the Swahili coast, things that don't even, are like a city like Malacca, like they're still a big deal trade-wise. And so, and a lot of it's just, you know, geographic, like you just kind of have to, it's why Panama is an important country, right? Because there's a big canal there. And it's this yeah. the original Panama Canal, you have to cut through it. I like that. Yeah, it's like all of those different Southeast Asian kingdoms. And by the way, if you look at 1.3 and you're like, what? Uh, I did a video. I did a video all on 1.3 where I clarify this. I talk about four states in Southeast Asia that you should probably know. I talk about Khmer, Malacca, Srivijaya, and Majapahit. So if you're like, what are y'all talking about? What are those words you're saying? Feel free to go check and out I that. I did a whole one on Srivijaya, so. Beautiful, I, yes. I, I wasn't as all four. I just picked one. I picked, the, what I, half the time I picked one, I'm like, I don't know that much about it. Maybe I should know about it. So, yeah, uh, that's what I did. Uh, there's tons of sources out there. So, and, and like Ms. Glinkler saying for big picture stuff, Start with 1.3, type in H-E-I-M-L-E-R 1.3 and watch that. Yeah. Like, and if you're like, I have no, if you're like, oh, I kind of know, but I don't know that one. What is that one thing? Maybe there's videos like the ones we just said where you can go and get it. Or, you know, maybe you don't need 10 minutes on Trivijay and you're like, who cares? I get it. It's a trade spot moving on. Like yeah. however you want, there's, there's so many resource, free resources out there for you to just go out and get. So, uh, anyway, yeah. support for Heimler. And I think also like one of the things that we're going to see another common development that's happening 
is that in these places like these trading city states where you have a ton of different people coming and meeting, like what you just said of like, it's the port city, it's the place you got to go. You're also going to see one of my favorite developments, which is syncretism, right? So syncretism is where you have like two different cultures colliding and they create something new. Syncretism isn't like this culture conquers this one. It's they create something new and unique. And so that's why like Swahili, for example, is a language that's a mixture of Bantu, African and Arabic. So it's a great example. You see it in architecture too, with a place like uh, Angkor Wat, which is this huge palace is the capital of the Khmer Empire. And it was a Hindu palace. It has Hindu architecture. But then somewhere along the way, the Khmer royalty converted to Buddhism. And so then they started putting Buddhist statues everywhere. So you have this like Hindu style palace that's now actually a Buddhist place. And so you have this example. And that's why, frankly, a lot of those Southeast Asian kingdoms are really confusing to people because and to me, because I'll be researching it and I'll go look it up and it'll say it's a Hindu Buddhist state. And I'm like, what does that mean? How can it be both? And so what that might mean is you might have like a Hindu society that is still really like dominated by like South Asian kind of the caste system, whatever. But then maybe the elites have converted to Buddhism because Buddhists are out traveling and trading a lot more. Right. In the same way that over in the other. So you want to be like the big boys. yeah? Exactly. Or you might see one that like has a lot of Hindu Buddhist cultural society stuff. But then the leadership, it's a sultanate, which means it's Islamic. And so in a lot of those, you have a ton of diversity, which is a really cool development. And so again, to Mr. Freeman's point, you don't need to understand the whole social hierarchy of, Majapa of the Majapahit kingdom. But if they asked you, like, identify one example of, you know, syncretism or cultures colliding or whatever in the Indian Ocean trade, you could say, well, uh, in... Like Majapahit, it was both a Hindu and a Buddhist state because those different cultures were all trading in the same area. Or you could say in this on the Swahili coast, the language of Swahili was a mixture of the native African language and Arabic from Arab traders. Like you want to know those things just as, again, an illustrative example of the bigger development that they, they want to make sure you understand that these are like real people. And that when a person travels and lives somewhere else, they also bring with them their religion and their culture and their food and whatever, right? Can we put this in, in real, we've been talking about a bunch of stupid history no one cares about. Can we talk about Star Wars for a second? So think about, we're all watching The Mandalorian, right? And we all love it, agreed. So whenever he's like out or any Star Wars person, when you're ever with a group of people, they're all like aliens and they're all hanging out together. They're all one way. But whenever they're in a bar or whenever they're in a port city, there's like a million different people of a different kind. You would find Malacca would be, it would be aliens. They'd be people, but you'd be like, Hey, there's a Buddhist monk or Hey, that guy has a cross around his neck. What's going on there? Like, Hey, that guy's praying towards Mecca. Like they're all in one spot because it's the trade has brought them all together in some way, shape or form. So, uh, so yeah, don't get too confused in Seth. Man, Southeast Asia is confusing to me too, so don't feel bad. Don't yeah. feel bad. Um, and a few people are asking in the chat, like, what about, are there some examples of this in Islam? Because we've talked about Islam going and spreading. Oh, yeah, right? Islam, this is one of the reasons why Ibn Battuta makes his whole career. Ibn Battuta makes his whole career traveling around the Islamic world and being like, whoa, everyone's really different. <laughs> <laughs> like these people in this African kingdom are practicing Islam in this totally different way. We find like in his writings, one um, African group is still matriarchal. So they're Islamic, but they're still matriarchal. And women are the, like the ones that are running the family and society, even though they're also still practicing Islam. Or if you go to India after the Muslims conquer India, you'll see a building like, I always say it wrong, but it's the Qutub Minhar, which is like a huge mosque and minaret in Delhi. And that's a physical example of sort of conquest and syncretism where you have, they used the bricks and stones from local Hindu temples to then build a mosque, right? So there are times when you have one culture sort of dominating another and asserting dominance. But you have others where it's mixing. I put another example in the chat too of like the Grand Jena Mosque in Mali, which is this huge mosque that's still around, but it's made in the traditional African mud brick style. And so it looks totally different than other mosques that you would see in the rest of the Islamic world because it's taken some of the cultural elements of the places where it was built. We also looked up one, there was a mosque in one of the Sohili city-states that was made out of coral which is like such a cool example of that. What do you have around you? You have, it was used out actually making coral, using coral and Indian marble. And it was like, well, hello, trade routes. You get marble from India, you get coral locally, and you get Islam from Arabia, and you create this really cool mosque.
That's great. Right. It's awesome. Okay. So the last thing that we need to talk about is the impact of the trade routes, which we've already gotten to, but it's like, they're not just spreading people or goods, they're spreading crops, they're spreading innovations, they're spreading people and culture. And I think we've really hit this already, but what would you say are like the big key terms that kids should associate with something like this? For, for uh, crops, innovations, people, and culture. Well, yeah, let's crops, start with crops. Crops is easy. Crops is chompa rice. It revol- It doubles, doubles, triples, at least doubles the population of Song China. So now most of those people are going to be killed by the Mongols anyway, but it's a big deal, right? You can grow like three crops a year and plus they're draining swampland and all that stuff. So there, there's other ways of them increasing uh, food production, but there's a big uh, almost famine like around uh, a thousand and once once uh chompa rice comes in all of a sudden you have extra food and if you ever uh look at like uh, population charts and you're like notice like how in like the 1800s it starts to go up and keep going up and like now there's a lot of people um the reason people are alive now is because babies are living like it's not like it, there just wasn't enough food back then you used to not so weird you used to not name a baby until their second birthday it was their naming day because they didn't want you to get attached to it because babies just died all the time back in the 1700s the average woman had 17 children right and like none of them would live so all of a sudden with all this food wow all my kids are living now i have all these people and the more people who can farm and you can produce more and on and on and on so chopper rice i i mean besides it was my first video and if you do watch it uh i didn't know my camera had a better setting so it's set really bad so that's my bad but it's a really big deal i mean if you're increasing the population of China, that's a massive deal. The only other thing that really rivals that is like the Colombian exchange, which is a unit four thing. So, yeah. so that's a big deal. I mean, they mentioned citrus fruits and bananas, which are fine. But <laughs> if the Chinese aren't farming it, then who cares? You know, I give we'll bananas learn. their day in my class. I'm like, hey, but also shout out to bananas. Coming from Southeast Asia to Africa, they have a similar impact on East Africa, where it's like a lot more nutritional, has a lot more calorie dense. And so it helps with the population. But yeah, it can't compete with chompa rice. It's just a thing. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. And we've already talked about... Innovation, the trade stuff. I mean, it's all it's all the stuff that helps with trade from yeah. caravan sarais and camels to uh, compasses and printing and paper money and gunpowder. A lot of stuff that's like infancy in this unit. Like if you're like, oh, gunpowder is one of the things they, they traded. Okay, let's go to unit three, the gunpowder empire. Like these mm-hmm. things pay for it big time or the plague going across, like, which isn't an innovation, but um, any innovations here are essentially besides like, even printing, you could count as printing money, and then you could put that with flying money. So, like, it's really anything that helps trade better. So, whether that's navigation or boats or camels or just caravans, right? So, and for people, for people, if you only study one person in either of these two units, uh, Ms. Glenkler already said it, his name is Ibn Battuta, and yes, he's that big of a deal. He's arguably the most important person in the first four units. He's a really, really big deal. And, I mean, you could tie him to any facet of any of these things, and he either lived there went there or said he went there. And so he's all, and he wrote it down. And so we have it and you can see where he, he, he lived in Delhi for like 14 years as the lead like Islamic judge. Like this guy's everywhere. All, and and he's, it's weird. Like if there wasn't even two your history teacher would hate it because there's like one guy, one source, not comparing sources. Well, he's been to all these cities and he's like, well, this one's the best one. And, or Islam in Africa is weird compared to where I'm from. And you know, once you get to China, it's different. And it's so for people, oh, you got him in all caps. All right, cool. Oh, Marjorie Kemp, of course. Sorry, Marjorie. Kemp. I mean, also Marco Polo and Marjorie Kemp, but they they most they go to one place. You know, Marco Polo goes to China for a while, and then comes back to Italy. And Marjorie Kemp kind of travels around the Holy Land and stuff. So it's like it's just not as broad as Ibn Battuta goes everywhere. I mean, it's just really impressive. And so in terms of people, you also want to think about merchant communities. And so this is where we get something like a term. That is one of those like AP terms that we all know, but like it's a weird word you might not know, which is diasporic communities, right? Where a diaspora, people kind of spread out around the globe and then they set up little communities where they live near other people that are like them. And the two groups you're going to see that with the most is going to be with Jewish people and with Arab traders. And so... This is where if you go to China, you'll read documents and you very well might see a document on a test that's describing a Chinese city and talking about the Jewish quarter and the Arab quarter and the Persian quarter. And what that means is like 
there are people that then just live permanently in these places and work as like emissaries to trade back and forth. One of the reasons why the Jewish people step into that role is because it's one of the only things they're allowed to do economically. In most societies, they're not allowed to own land and they're allowed to charge interest on loans, which Christian communities are not. And so they step into the role of banking and trading. And so they kind of travel around the world. And so again, all of these are like kind of obvious developments that you just logically know. When you have trade and travel, you have expats. You have people that go and live in China right now because they're doing business but in the ap land in unit one we call them diasporic communities or your town may have a chinatown like yeah where, exactly where standing in the middle of it be like am i in china or but no you're not it's just that's where they they've kind of like they're living in diaspora they're living away from whatever so uh so yeah and china obviously there's going to be more of them in china because everybody's trying to get to china yeah Kublai Khan didn't Kublai Khan ruled china didn't like the Chinese people, he would only listen to Persian people. So these people are all, don't think that everybody is sequestered in little sections anymore. If the theme, may, maybe a hundred years before this, that's more so, but all of these like lines and map stuff, everyone's now connected. People are moving all over. Uh, when Marco Polo gets to China, there's Christians there. So it's not like anything is new to anyone at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're we're coming at uh, seven my time eight your time and I don't I know I know at some point you need to head out I'm gonna I'm gonna address these last two kind of questions and do a quick little Q and A um, but I wanted to give just give you a heads up if you need to okay I can stay for a couple more minutes I think beautiful um, yeah and so there's a great question in the chat about powerful cities that emerge because of trade this is where like on the Swahili coast any of those Swahili city states um, Mombasa Kilwa. Um, Malacca is my favorite example in Southeast Asia because Malacca lasts for a long time. So if you learn a little bit about Malacca, it's, you're going to get bang for your buck throughout a few units. And then we also have a lot in Central Asia, these sort of oasis trading cities like Kashgar, um, which is in kind of Western China or one of the stands now. And so um, you, you can go look and you can kind of have your specific examples that you can draw upon. No person in their right mind would ask you to like write an essay on Kashgar, but they might they might want you to talk about the effect of the Silk Road. And then you could talk about the rise of important trading cities and use that as an example. Or you could identify identify a trade city, maybe it may something like that. And the, the College Board gives those two specifically as the illustrative examples, either Samarkand or Kashgar. And yeah. if you just need to just pick one with Kashgar sounds like something you can rhyme with. I don't know. Then you can do that, whichever one you do. That's a good one. And just another quick plug for the maps on my web. I try to put those cities, the ones that can be helped. Like, uh, and it, it's all the cities that you've been thinking about anyway. So like, oh, if you're talking about, uh, oh, uh, uh, Mons Moose and uh, Timbuktu, that's a trade city. That's arguably the trade city, right? There's tons of uh, Constantinople. Uh, what else is on it? Hangzhou, Mala, like any of those. And a lot of them pay forward. Like China's capital will be Baghdad. It still is from here on. So, uh, a lot of these things pay for it. I mean, Samarkand and Kashgar, you'll never be at. You'll never hear those words ever again in your life unless you're in Central Asia. But those are examples of trade cities, so. Yeah, and um, and I just put some in the chat too, if you just need some to be able to kind of identify. I think the last two questions here is like, you know, in terms of complexity, wanting to really think about, okay, not everything's the same. Like the Americas are obviously the big exception here that like the Americas are really growing in isolation. And so, and it's not really that trade routes connected those civilizations more than ever before. So just as a side note, you do still need to know about the Americas, right? And they did trade and exchange. We have evidence, I did my, master's degree in Latin American history. So I'm really big on this, but like they did trade. There's evidence of like the Inca trading all the way up to people in like the American Southwest, but just not nearly in the same way we have in Afro-Eurasia because you're traveling across different latitudes and different climates and across mountain ranges. And it's just a lot harder. And you also don't have domesticated animals. I say this in my class over and over again, llamas are useless. Llamas are adorable and useless. They carry up to 30 pounds and if you put on more than 30 pounds, they just collapse and sit there and stare at you. I've seen it happen, right? They are adorable, though. I just don't know if capybaras are from Latin America. 
capybara. The largest rodent in the world, a capybara, but you can't put any weight on them. They're too adorable. No, it's not useful. And so all of their labor is happening with human labor, which makes it, in my opinion, more impressive. I wish I lived in the Incan Empire. I'm obsessed with them, but they are a little bit unique. They're still using belief systems to maintain power. They are still gathering tribute payments. They are still doing a lot of these same things, but they're doing them in isolation. And so that's one where you might just need to pick one of those two civilizations, either the Aztec or the Inca, and just sort of study them in a little bit of detail because a lot of things they're doing are unique. Um, the way they're interacting with their environment is unique. You have chinampas, um, like in the Aztec, this floating garden that they build out of a swamp, not to be confused with champa rice. I know it's annoying. Yeah. Or you have terrace agriculture in the Inca that gives them so much crop diversity that the Inca at their height had 4,200 different types of potatoes. Just 4,200 different types of potatoes because they were growing potatoes at like 11,000 feet in altitude. And it changes things. They had yeah. potatoes that were like as big as your pinky and purple and adorable, right? So they're still doing a lot of these same things, but they're just doing them in isolation. And so they're coming out a little bit different, but not worse, just different. Anyway, I love the Inca so much. I've been to Peru twice. My last question, and here's where I'm going to start beef with John Green. I really want to start a turf four with John, John Green. And I don't know if you, if you want to not be involved in this, um, if you don't want to get into this battle, but I disagree. Oh, I don't know John. I don't know John Green. You do? No, I don't. Oh, I don't either. One time, but that was, I don't know. I don't either know John Green, but I want him to know me. Spread the word. I'm coming for him because I don't think the Mongols were the exception. I actually think the Mongols are like an ideal example of like all these different, a lot of different developments that we talk about in this time period. We talk about like the rise of a new powerful state because of trade and innovation with like Genghis Khan was an innovator. They then become a powerful land-based empire that controls trade routes. They use culture to unify, but they use it by like adopting the culture of the places that they conquer. I actually really feel like the Mongols sort of looked around and took all the developments that other powerful states were doing and just did them better and did them in this huge empire. But that's just me. No, I get that. I can't take away from the models. There's certain things that are like an exception for them, but the more you look into them, they're not, they're not really. So I think it's more of a, I guess for him, it was probably more of a joke that he started with. and was like, I guess I better keep it going. I don't but accept it. Don't I accept don't take it as a joke. I take my Mongols very seriously. If they were here, <laughs> I would take them incredibly seriously. <laughs> I'm not messing with them at all. Like, yeah, I'm, everyone's, sorry, all your history teachers are obsessed with the Mongols. They're just like. They're just the best. They're fascinating. But I actually like the Inca better. And so feel free to, feel free to come at me. I did a whole podcast episode about it. But I think that what I'm trying to show you here is the way you should be studying. What you just noticed me and Mr. Freeman do is we talked about these general developments. Okay, trade routes are making states. Like what state? so on and so forth. Then you say, are there any exceptions to this? And if there are, like if the Mongols are doing things slightly differently, if the American civilizations are doing things slightly differently, okay, then you might need to just kind of sit down and learn about those because you can't like lump them in to this bigger trend as easily, right? And that's totally fine. Um, and again, we're not pretending that what we just talked about for 40 minutes is everything you need to know about units one and two, but we're trying to demonstrate how you should study, right? You should start with these big statements, these big ideas. And if you're not sure what they are, go find the CED. I have a copy on my website or go check out like what the Heimler's videos or whatever and get an idea of what the big idea is and then work your way down into the details like we just did, right? Um, and I guess I'll end with just a reminder of like some of the resources that we've just talked about. So a reminder is, uh, ooh, it's gonna make me save this thing. Um, let me save this really quickly. Beautiful, okay, now I can clear it. So a review of our favorite resources, go to Heimler for the big picture and then come to Antisocial Studies and Freemanpedia for in depth. If you find like, I need an illustrative example of this thing, come to one of our channels. We've probably made a video on it and find us there. Do you have any other favorite resources where you send your kids? Um, if we use the AMSCO book, that, I think that's pretty decent. Same. Giving you like what you really need. Um, but if you're finding like videos or two, da, 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 somebody's talking and blah, 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 and you need like a slower pace. If you do go to my website, it's not just videos. Like if you go to um, it's got it broken. There's a banner. You click on that banner for that era. It breaks it down. You can look at it piece by piece. And there's tons of videos there too. Like not just um, 
just on like like Chinampas or I think that one has like Robocop narrating but like <laughs> all those there's like a little video there's like sometimes 10 to 12 little like two three minute videos on stuff like that that may may help you when like if it's just something like somebody we just mentioned in passing we're like oh caravan's right like wait, wait what's that uh maybe you can find it uh more calmly that way I guess mm -hmm. uh but otherwise um one of your best resources is all the people in your class. If you can have like a conversation, like at least partially, and somebody's like, yeah, you know, like uh, like the like Champa Rice, and you're like, what? What are you talking about? And hearing it from another person, your own age can be helpful. And when you're in college, you're going to be doing study groups anyway. So uh, I'm sorry if you have a test on this tomorrow, but you know, maybe get on with other people and talk it out. And just like, I don't get this, or I don't understand that. Like, you're all going through the same struggle at the same time. Some of you better, some of you worse, and working together can only help all of you. Yeah. And you can also come back and join me. So I'll, I'll be doing this again on Wednesday. Um, hopefully, Mr. Fr I, Mr. Ruman can join me, hopefully. But if not, I'll, it'll be fine. I'll carry the load. But on Wednesday at the same time, um, we're going to be doing the same thing on units three and four. And instead of study tips, I'm going to talk a little more specifically about multiple choice strategy. That's something a lot of people have been asking for. And that's one thing that I know if you have a, a midterm, there's probably going to be some multiple choice on there because let's be honest your teacher doesn't want to just have to grade essays over the winter break um and so come join us again and we'll talk about the major developments from units three and four and we'll also look at some strategy i'll actually pull up some sample multiple choice and we'll walk through like how should you approach this when you take the test um and no this is not mr heimler <laughs> So people are asking like wait hold on this is mr freeman of freemanpedia his website is like legendary amongst ap world history teachers we uh -huh. both know and love heimler too there's no there's no Great. i just texted him He's there's no jets and sharks here we're all we're all ap world history nerd friends but no this is emily glankler of anti-social studies ben freeman of freemanpedia um and also we love heimler so go see him as well big deal all right. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me, Mr. Freeman. Everyone else, I'm going to be posting this on my YouTube. Um, you can also come find me on Instagram. I'll DM me and I normally can respond. So come find me on Instagram at anti social studies. I know, Mr. Freeman, you're more active on Twitter. Is that right? Yeah, but I don't know who's on Twitter. And that's another thing I was going to get on Instagram. I was like, I don't know. Who I so that's why I did my YouTube channel because I figured that was easier. But yeah, I'm at Freemanpedia on Twitter. I post me. Oh, hey. Uh, coming up, uh, in it tends to be in February, I do the Around the AP World in 80 Days Countdown, where I do awesome. one topic every day for 80 days. It's for 80 days. So it's, uh, that's, and it covers everything for the entire course. So once we get there in February, so if you follow me or your teacher might know, uh, I'll just be posting. And it's just a quick little like, okay, today is uh, uh, 1.2 or something it goes all, all the way through the entire course day by day so if you just need to, to chunk it out because some of you may be waiting to the last second that's not good so and that's gonna be on your youtube or on your website normally on my website do i make 80 videos maybe i make 80 videos that's i don't know but yeah, definitely be following both of us because as we ramp up, especially after the new year, like you are going to be seeing so much review material from me, Mr. Freeman and Heimler. And so make sure that you're subscribed to all of our YouTube channels so that you see when we post stuff and follow us on social media or whatever. And we'll let you know about things that we're doing because we're all like, we're just full-time teachers and we're here to help. And we want to make this, we love AP World History and we want to make this as fun and easy as possible for you to understand what we're talking about. So just make sure that you're checking out what we're doing. Maybe hopefully see us back here on Wednesday. Um, and then spread the word. Tell your friends if you thought this was helpful and share with them the video because it'll be posted right after this is over. All right. I got to go put my kid to bed. I don't know about you, but I'm going to go. I got to go. What am I doing? Well, I'm waiting on Mandalorian on Friday, so I don't have much to do. I'm going to go put myself to bed. How does that sound? There we go. All right, cool. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see y'all soon. Bye, guys. Study hard. Uh -huh.